Welcome to block eight. A house divided cannot stand. Block eight is the story of how the two sections of the United States, the North and the South, after developing differently and being very different culturally and economically and socially, became so different that the differences began to overwhelm the similarities. And the years, but and we and we've seen this sectional tension before. That there was sectional tension, tension uh, during the Constitutional Convention, and there was sectional tension during the War of 1812, and there was sectional tension, obviously uh, Missouri Compromise, and then obviously the sectional tension um, that resulted in the nullification debate, where secession was openly talked about uh, in the South for the first time. The years between 1850 and 1860, that decade, marked the ever-increasing, growing apart of the two sections of the United States. And the United States really split into two separate cultural nations, the North and the South. And finally, the distinctions between the two, finally the differences between the two, would be resolved in a colossally huge civil war. So. This block is going to take us from the Mexican War's end to the Civil War's beginning, a period of only 13 years. All right, so let's start with uh, the first section of notes, the Compromise of 1850. This was the last great compromise um, that allowed the Union to kind of go on and persevere uh, as it's completely different sections were kind of grinding on each other and ripping each other apart. The Compromise of 1850 kind of papered over those divisions. And at the time, people were very, very optimistic that it would be the last time that the United States needed to compromise. Uh, so the, the story of the Compromise of 1850 starts with the territory that was taken from Mexico after the Mexican War. All right. Much opposition to the Mexican War had centered on the northern states, and especially New England, who feared that this territory here, that the United States wanted to take from Mexico, would be used to create new slave states. So the Whigs were kind of against the war from the start. Now, Democrats in the North, led by Martin Van Buren, were anti-slavery but pro-expansion. So it was a combination of the slave interests here in the South and the expansionary Democrats here in the North that kind of defeated the Whigs uh, and allowed the Mexican War to take place. And the Mexican War was very successful for the United States, and the United States kind of took all of that territory. Um... And it was divided into th uh, two major sections. California, here along the coast, we all know where California is, and the rest of it was called the New Mexico Territory. All right, so this is gonna be, this is called the New Mexico Territory and the California Territory there along the coast. The North was kind of looking for ways to make sure that slavery did not spread in this land, and what uh, what they did uh, was became known as literacy as the Wilmot Proviso. Wilmot, after uh, a Pennsylvania congressman, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, who introduced it, it was a regular it was a regular day in Congress. They were passing a bill funding the war, and then David Wilmot of Pennsylvania decided to kind of uh, stir things up a little bit. Um, slavery had been kind of off the table as a topic in Congress for a long time. The congressmen very often didn't even talk about slavery, but Wilmot was an abolitionist, and Wilmot said uh, he put an amendment on the bill. The bill was going through Congress totally normally, and then as any congressman can do, Congressman Wilmot amended or offered an amendment to the bill, and his amendment stated, as an express and fundamental condition, to the acquisition of territory for the Republic of Mexico, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist. And what Wilmot's doing is he's trying to get ahead of this train a little bit. And Wilmot is saying, any territory we take from Mexico, no slavery will be allowed there. The territories will be uh, free, uh, free soil for free labor, no slaves. 
The House of Representatives, which is dominated by the North because they have more population, passed. The Wilmot Proviso passes in the House, but as soon as it gets to the Senate, it dies. And why does it die in the Senate? Because in the Senate, the South is equal. In 1848, there are an equal number of slave states and free states, and anything that the slave states do not want to happen can be blocked in the Senate. And the Senate blocks Wilmot's Proviso. This angers the North. By 1850, all of that work that the abolitionists had been doing, white abolitionists like uh, Garrison, black abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, and the work of literally thousands and thousands of reformers had made the North anti-slavery. That did not mean they, most Northerners uh, believed in racial equality. They certainly did not. But the North was, by 1850, anti-slavery, and especially against the spread of slavery in the territories. So the North, when the South blocks this Wilmot Proviso, the North grows angry. Now in the South, now we're going to see through the course of this block a lot of reactions by Southerners that don't seem to make sense. But one thing that we have to understand, if we're going to understand the South, we have to try to put ourselves in the shoes of Southerners. They have become, by 1850, very defensive about their so-called, as they called it, peculiar institution, the institution of slavery. They were very defensive about it. They don't, didn't like to see it attacked. The North was big, it was powerful, it was growing, it was richer. And the South said, this is our way of life. And they were very defensive about it. They were very insulted that Northerners claimed that slavery could not be spread. They said, this is federally controlled land. How come your way of life and your economic system automatically means it has to go in there? So Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, who by 1848 is getting old, er, uh, he is still the leader of the South. Calhoun responds to Wilmot's proviso. And Calhoun himself introduced two measures to kind of say, you want to pass your idea of what the territory should be like, so will I. So the first thing that Calhoun tried to pass was that Congress could actively not ban slavery from any territory. Why, Calhoun said? Well, the territories do not belong to any individual state, north or south. They belong to all the states. The territories belong to all the states in the country, not just the North. And Calhoun said, if it belongs to everyone, slavery has to be allowed because slavery is allowed in some of the states. He also had Congress, or tried to have Congress, guarantee pr the, property, the property rights of slave owners. So you have the Wilmot Proviso, Northerners love it, Southerners hate it. You have Calhoun's proposals. The South likes it, the North is repulsed by it. And Calhoun's proposals pass in the Senate, but not the House. Wilmot's proviso passes in the House, but not the Senate. And there things sit. Well, there are a couple of possible compromises here. The first compromise that people come up with is that the Missouri Compromise Line. If you remember back, the line at the southern tip of Missouri in 1820 allowed for slavery in the state of Missouri, but that was it. Everything else above that line would be free. So some people said, okay, let's, let's deal with this reasonably. Let's just take the line and extend that line all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Anything below the line, slavery is allowed. Anything above the line, slavery is not allowed. At first glance, it might seem that the sections of the country, the North and the South, would go for this. But by 1848, 1850, the North is against any further spread of slavery. To them, extending the line, all that means is there's going to be more slavery in the United States, and that is something that they are not willing to countenance. 
So the second idea for a compromise is going to be one of the most important ideas of this entire block. The second compromise idea was to have each new territory decide for itself by a vote of the settlers each new territory would decide for itself whether it would be a free territory or a slave territory and then a free state or a slave state. This is an important key word. This idea that the settlers in the territories in question decide for themselves if they're going to have slavery or not is known as popular sovereignty. Sovereignty meanings are meaning having ultimate authority and popular meaning uh, of the people. That popular sovereignty means that the ultimate decision about slavery is going to be left in the hands of the people. Congress would have nothing to say about slavery. It would be entirely up to the settlers. In the election of 1848, which was won by the Whig Zachary Taylor, as we saw last block, in the election of 1848, the Democrat, Lewis Cass, ran on this as a solution to the problem. But because Americans were so afraid of the slavery issue, it was kind of ignored in this presidential election. So it sat there until the issue was unavoidable. In 1848, the issue is avoidable. Not many people, not many Americans especially, are living out in the territory ceded by Mexico. So while there's no real people out there in any large numbers, you don't need a solution to the problem. And then they found gold at Sutter's Mill. All of a sudden, you needed a solution. Because by 1850, there's 100,000 people living in California. Now, if you remember back, President Taylor's plan was to have California skip territorial status entirely and become a state immediately. California had no slavery and would be admitted to the Union as a free state. And that was a problem for the South. Why? Because if California came in as a free state, the balance in the Senate would be upset. Now, with California as a free state, there would be one more free state than slave state. There is already more Northerners in the House. The Electoral College, which elects the president, is, is uh, dominated by the North. The Senate is the last place for the South to kind of hold on to any sort of power in the country. And as soon as California comes in as a free state, the North will dominate all three important parts of government, the House, the Senate, and the Presidency. As soon as Taylor comes out, radicals in the South were already starting to say that the South would have to choose between secession from the Union and surrender. Whether they were going to live the rest of their national life as a little section here in the corner of the country dominated by the big boys, or if they were going to be free and on their own. Would they be subject to the will and whim of the North, or would they be able to choose their own destiny? Now, this word, importance, cannot be overstated. I'm going to make it humongous. Secession, or two, Secede. To secede means, this is not in your notes, to, but we need to know what it means because we're going to talk about it all block. To secede means to leave. Secession is the act of leaving. So when it says that radicals in the South are already saying that the South would have to choose between secession and surrender, they would have to choose between surrendering to the North or leaving the Union entirely. And that is the situation as 1850 is in full swing. All right, number three, how did this get solved? And it got solved by, and it became known as the, so this is number three, the Compromise of 1850. And stepping into the breach one last time is the great compromiser himself, Henry Clay. By 1850, Henry Clay is an old man. He is bitter. He has been passed over for the presidency several times. He is in ill health. He does not feel good. 
He does not look good. But one more time, Henry Clay rises to the occasion and comes up with a compromise to save the union he loved. He put all of his bitterness aside and he put his still very, very fertile brain into working on a solution to the problem. And he came up with a solution and he went to his old friend, Daniel Webster, the great senator from the north, from Massachusetts. Webster was also physically failing. Webster had been a great drinker and smoker and eater and partier and the years of that abuse to him were starting to show. Um, he no longer had the great booming voice. He was sweaty a lot, and he would lose his wind very easily. But the minds were still there. And Clay went to Webster and says, Can you get behind me on this? And Webster looked it over and gave it his approval, and these two great lions of the Senate, these old lions of the Senate, who had been dominating the body for 30-plus years at this point, produced this compromise. And what was Clay's plan. It has five parts. Let's take them in turn. Clay's first part of Clay's Great Compromise, number one, admit California immediately as a free state. Clay's plan number one, admit California right away as a free state. Obviously this benefits the North. Okay, Clay says there's a benefit for the North. Number two, the rest of the Mexican session, all of this part except California, would be open to slavery. That's the New Mexico Territory and in the north what was already by then being called the Utah Territory. California is free. New Mexico is open to slavery. Utah is open to slavery. On the surface, it looks like this benefits the South, but in reality, neither one of these lands is good for slave, is good for plantation economies. So Clay thinks, look, it's going to be open to slavery, but slavery will never be big and powerful and popular there. They are they are deserts, and they are not suitable for intensive agriculture. So while it theoretically benefits the South. When this is being argued in Congress, Clay says, this is worth a thousand Wilmot provisos. Even if slavery is allowed there, it can't thrive there. The third part of the compromise, Texas's debts that had accrued while it was an independent republic. So for those nine years that Texas was an independent country, the debts that it had accrued would be assumed by the United States. That was kind of a throw that was kind of a sop or a gift to congressmen who were also speculating in land. People who had invested in Texas liked this because that meant their bonds would be paid back. Clay knew that a lot of congressmen had invested a lot of money in Texas. So he threw this in here to get some support from both sides of the country. There are northern speculators that invested in Texas, and there are southern speculators that invested in Texas. And if Texas's debts are assumed by the United States, that can only help them. Number four, the slave trade would be abolished in Washington, D.C. It was a very incongruous thing. Blocks away from the capital of this, f the freest nation on earth, blocks away from the United States capital, were slave markets, where slaves could be bought and sold. Slaves would be marched in chains up and down Pennsylvania Avenue from the White House to the Congress. And it struck foreign visitors as incongruous. Huh? This is a, a, a democratic, freedom-loving republic, and yet in the capital city, you have slave markets, and it touched, it, it made northerners think the United States was hypocritical, and it was generally, it was very bad public relations for the United States. So the fourth part of the, con of the, of the compromise was that the slave trade would be outlawed in Washington. Not slavery itself, but the slave trade would be outlawed. You could still have a slave in Washington, you just could not buy, sell, or trade in human flesh in the American capital any longer. 
This is not totally unacceptable to the South, and it's good for the North, so this one's not so bad. Number five is the big throwout to the South. Number five, the fugitive slave law would be strengthened. This angered Northerners greatly. Abolition, the fugitive slave law says if a slave runs away from the South to the North, it is the responsibility of every American citizen to help recapture that slave. Because they're breaking the law, they are the property of their master, every single person has to assist in the return of captured slaves. Well, this drives abolitionists up the wall. They said, this turns every single person in the North into a slave catcher. And it was true, technically, that everyone in that, that the fugitive slave law allowed um, government officials to form posses and arrest people and require subpoenas and require service. The, the blacks accused of being former slaves could not testify uh, to their own defense. Uh, the fugitive slave law, the fifth part, this was the big throw, away, throw out to the South and it really angered the North. Abolitionists claimed and made them into slave catchers, and they absolutely positively refused to do that. They said, how can the law require me to help catch slaves? But that was the fifth part of the compromise. Clay, on the floor of the Senate, 70 years old, gives this great last speech. He can't even finish it. He is so exhausted. He, it, the speech is finished by a character whom we are going to be seeing a lot of in this block, a young senator by the name of Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is a, a follower in many ways of Clay, and Douglas finishes Clay's speech. Clay's already gotten the support of Webster from the North, if you remember. So how does the South react? How does the great, you know, leader of the South, John C. Calhoun, react to this? Calhoun is failing physically faster than even Clay and Webster. He writes the speech, his mind is still good, but he is too weak to deliver it. In fact, he will die only four weeks later. He sits wrapped in his giant blanket on the floor of the Senate as he has another Southern Senator read his response. Calhoun rejects the compromise 100%. He demands that the North give way on every point, and he has nothing to offer constructively. Calhoun has no compromise to throw out to the North. So he says, look, if we can't compromise, let us peacefully go our separate ways. He argues for a peaceful secession of the Southern states if the North will not agree. And then he says, if the North is unwilling to let the slaves, excuse me, if the North is unwilling to let the Southern states go peacefully, then the Southern states will fight to defend that right. As soon as Calhoun's speech was done, Webster took the floor, sweating, hesitating. No longer that great booming voice that had dominated the Senate for so long. And he begged the North to accept the compromise, even though parts of it were unacceptable. Well, after Webster spoke, the three great lions of the Senate had their final major say in the history of the nation. Clay, Calhoun, Webster. But the debate was not over. In perhaps the greatest debate in the history of the American government, every, pretty much every senator had their say, took the floor, defended their points of view, attacked other points of view. Every important senator, which was all of them pretty much, had his say. It looks as if the Congress might be moving to accept a compromise. But there is one big problem, and that big problem is Zachary Taylor. President Taylor is against the compromise. President Taylor says, look, this is too much. I have a simpler solution. He says, we're going to admit California as a free state, and we're going to admit New Mexico as a slave state, and then everyone goes home happy. California free, New Mexico slave, equal in the Senate. Let's stop talking about this. This is unacceptable to everyone because it did not address every, anyone, any other concern. The North has lots of concerns about this. They want to know about future territories. The South has concerns about this. How can they guarantee that, you know, th their way of life will be protected? And people kind of say to the president, that's not enough. But President Taylor is a stubborn man. And he sticks to it. Clay 
Clay and Stephen Douglas look at the opposition of the White House and say, let's cross that bridge when we get there. Let's try to pass this bill, and then we can work on the president. Clay's final act of genius is not to try to pass this as one law. He takes the five parts, and he tries to pass them as five separate bills. So there's a bill to admit California. Well, all the northerners are going to support that. It'll pass. There's a bill to assume Texas's debts. There's a separate bill to have New Mexico territory have slavery. There's a separate bill to outlaw the slave trade. There's a separate bill to strengthen the fugitive slave law. Small, complex, and ever-shifting groups are voting on these five things. There only, and as it says, literally only 28 representatives and four senators voted yes on everything. And very few people voted no, or nobody voted no on everything. That the combinations that went, that passed the Compromise of 1850 were shifting. Things that benefited the North, the North voted for. Things that benefited the South, the South voted for. And the deciding votes, the deciding votes, both by Whigs and Democrats, were usually cast in the border states. The border states had the most to lose from secession and war, because the war would be fought in the border states. So border states like Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Maryland, provided the compromise votes. The North was the North. The South was the South. But it was this middle that kind of provided the compromise votes to get this thing through Congress. And get through Congress it did. It was not a compromise in the traditional sense of the word. Really, it was, it was not two sides giving up something and meeting in the middle for the most part. It was different groups of politicians voting for different things. More Democrats supported it than Whigs, but party lines never held strongly. Whigs in the North were more likely to agree with Democrats in the North. Democrats in the South were more likely to agree with Whigs in the South. You are starting to see the parties break up. And people are starting to vote solely on their sectional preference. And like we said, number two, the border states who had the most to lose provided the votes to put the compromises through. Finally, the five bills passed Congress. And Z by that time, Zachary Taylor was no longer a problem. Why was Zachary Taylor no longer a problem? Zachary Taylor, the story goes, had... That's not Taylor. Zachary Taylor, the story goes, had enjoyed a bowl of frozen strawberries and ice cream. And he kind of went upstairs not feeling too good. And it turned out, it seems, that there was something in the food. Food, food poisoning. Nothing, no assassination, no crazy assassination attempts or anything. But President Taylor came down with a very severe case of food poisoning, of all things, in the hot summer of 1850, after enjoying this tasty dish of frozen strawberries and ice cream. Uh, and a, a few short weeks later, President Taylor died uh, of this food poisoning. He was succeeded by his vice president, Millard Fillmore. Um, Taylor was stubborn. Taylor said, my way or the highway. Ah, there goes Joe. Taylor says, my way or the highway. California, free state, New Mexico, a slave state, we're done. We're not compromising. Fillmore is a politician. Fillmore is, says, yes, let's welcome compromise. Fillmore is very happy to sign these five bills into law, and in the fall of 1850, the Compromise of 1850, became the law of the land. And most Americans sighed a huge sigh of 
relief. The compromise was exceedingly popular. Nobody in 1850 wanted war. Nobody in 1850 wanted secession. Nobody wanted the country to split apart. Only the harshest partisans, only the most extreme abolitionists, and the most extreme pro-slavery people had a problem with the Compromise of 1850. It is incredibly popular, and sadly, to many Americans, it seems that the slavery issue has been put to bed for good and that it would never again pop up to threaten the harmony of the Union. It lasted about 18 months.